that we were being audio and video recorded. Um, and instead of a roll call, I'm going to let the counselors introduce themselves for any of you who don't know us. Starting with me, I'm Gina Louise Shara. I'm the Ward 4 City Councilor, and I'm the chair of this committee. I'm Dennis Bidwell. I'm Ward 2 City Councilor, Vice Chair of the Committee. Maureen Cardi, Councilor from Ward 1. I'm Lisa Klein, the Councilor from Ward 7. And I'll introduce our Administrative Assistant, Pam Powers. Um, so if you are here, we're going to we start now with public comment as we do every meeting. Um, if you're here for the public forum, which I assume most of you are, I'd suggest you hold your comment until then, which will just be in a matter of minutes. Um, but if you're here to address the committee on a different matter outside the scope of the forums on the downtown economy, then this would be the time to come and do that. Um, and I'm just going to explain the rules of conduct that we follow here in this committee, which are the same as the, the uh, full city council. Um, and this, these rules apply both to the public comment that's happening in a moment and then the public forum, which will happen in a couple minutes. Um, we request civility and respect for all participants, though you may say what you like about us as counselors, um, as we're public figures. As a rule, we don't respond during public comment, but during the public forum, we, we can and will interact with you. Um, the public forum is primarily fact-finding for us, and we certainly want to hear your point of view. While we're asking for comments specific to your experience, uh, we ask that if you have something negative or defamatory to say about individuals, um, an individual or a business who are not public figures, that you not refer to them by name or obvious identifiers. Uh, this is not a forum for grievances against specific people or businesses, nor are we an enforcement body that can um, handle perceived violations. Um, and I'm sure that it won't be necessary, but if, if I feel that that rule um, is not being followed, I have the right to rule someone out of order. Um, when you come to the podium, please state your name and your address for the record. And we're going to ask that you limit your comments to five minutes. If someone has said what you already want to say, feel free to just come and indicate that so that we know that you agree with that point of view. Um, but don't feel like you need to say it again. And when the five minutes are up, you'll hear a tone, and I will ask you to please finish your thoughts and give someone else a turn. So with that, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Is anyone here for public comment? Nope. Okay. So, moving on from that, um, we just have one item of business to be formal from the forum, which is uh, to approve the minutes from our previous meeting of June 27th. Move to approve. Second. Um, any discussion on, on the minutes? No? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Any objections? Great. So, having done that, we can move into the public forum. Um, <clears throat> as I have said at previous forums, I'm going to briefly frame the purpose of what we're doing here. Um, today's public forum is centered around property ownership, leasing, the arts, and tourism. And it is the fourth in a series and the final forum in a series pertaining to a committee study request that we as a committee received on March 3rd from the City Council President and Vice President. Um, and that request was, quote, to study issues relative to the local economy with a focus on businesses, workers, and workers in downtown Northampton and Florence, end quote. To address this request, we've been gathering current data from within the city administration, from outside organizations, and by holding, <coughs> excuse me, by holding forums. We've already received reports from the city's economic development director, the director of planning and sustainability, the Greater Northampton Chamber of Commerce, and the Pioneer Valley Worker Center and UMass Amherst Labor Center. To date, we've held forums on May 16th, June 20th, and June 27th, centered around business owners and downtown workers and downtown residents. These forums are to solicit testimony from those directly involved in the downtown's economy on pressures that people feel and the issues they experience, as well as things that they think are done well um, and feel can be, can be supportive for any ideas that people have. Um, <clears throat> following these forums, the committee will submit a report to the full city council explaining the steps completed to fulfill the study. And actually, after the forum today, we are, will be discussing that report that we're going to submit. So feel free to stick around and hear that discussion if you're interested. Um, as we've said at every meeting since April 12th, we will not be deliberating on possible action until we've closed out the forums and have heard from everyone who wishes to testify. Uh, we've also had previously decided that we're not meeting in August. So for everyone following along with our schedule, uh, we will reconvene on September 19th and we'll begin deliberating on what we've heard and learned during the study and consider if there are recommendations or, um, of areas where the city council could take action. Um, to facilitate people following the study, we've created a webpage on the city website at northamptonma.gov. If you go under the city council section, there's a subsection that says committee study requests. And that, gives, that page gives an overview <coughs> of this process. It lists our schedule, 
links to all the materials that we've received, um, and links to the videos of the previous meetings and the agendas and minutes from the previous meetings. And also describes how to submit written testimony to Pam, um, our administrative assistant. So if anyone today has testimony that they want to give but don't want to stand up and give it um, here, please feel free to submit written testimony to us. So with that intro, I am going to open up the public forum. And I only have two names here. So I'm going to start with those two names, and then anyone else who'd like to speak, you're very, very welcome to. So the first name is Suzanne Beck. Hi. Uh, my name is Suzanne Beck. You're familiar, I think, with my role as the director of the Chamber of Commerce here at Northampton. You may be less familiar with my role as director of the Hampshire County Regional Tourism Council. So because you're one of your um, topics for today was about tourism um, and kind of getting an understanding of that economy. I wanted to share some information that we have that I think is very pertinent to your um, considerations about Northampton and downtown Northampton uh, and Florence in particular. So we all think about Northampton as a, a big driver of interest in visiting the area. We know that Northampton is a very important gateway for visitors who uh, want to spend some time here. It's also, Northampton is also very dependent on the tourism economy. And I'm going to share with you um, some data uh, just to give you a context for that um, so that you can get a sense of the scale of its importance to, um, to all of us, really. Uh, certainly, at the top of the list from the city council's perspective is the fact that tourism generates thousands of dollars in um, taxes, tax revenues for, for that end up being spent on important city services. And then we also want to think about the visitor spending that supports the vitality of downtown Northampton. And quite frankly, um, our ability to attract visitors um, to the area can be the difference maker in whether one of our local independent shops or cultural institutions or restaurants um, or even a hotel has enough of a market to be successful here. So I'm just going to give you some data. Uh, there's three sources. One is the U.S. Travel uh, Administration, which is kind of the uh, Department of Commerce standard bearer for measuring um, the tourism economy. The Massachusetts Office of Travel and Tourism, otherwise known as MOT, um, and an analysis that we've done, uh, the Northampton Chamber has done as part of an overall Hampshire County economic strategy. So, and just to keep in mind, for research purposes, a visitor is someone that travels more than 50, from more than 50 miles away. So it's not um, a lot of people that we think of as visitors from you know, Springfield or Hamden County or whatever. <coughs> uh, that's just a standardized definition. So in Hampshire County, visitors spend about $125 million annually here. Mott estimates that Northampton's share of that is about $54 million. There's 900 tourism jobs in the uh, in the county, and the, again, Mott estimates about 400 of those jobs are in Northampton, and the Northampton job space represents an annual payroll of just over 11 million. Now, these are jobs that are direct tourism jobs. So, hoteliers is a good example of uh, hotel workers is a good example of a tourism job. So, the state estimates that. Um, one and a half million dollars in local taxes is generated by visitors to Northampton. Now that includes hotel taxes, which you're very familiar with. It also includes uh, a percentage of the meals tax and a percentage of the sales tax that visitors spend while they're here. They average, they estimate that an average a visitor to our area will spend about three hundred and fifty dollars on it. That number for uh, in local taxes for the county, which is also important to all of us, is three and a half million. So the more important picture, though, is the effect that tourism has not only on its own self, but on the rest of our economy and, quite frankly, our quality of life. Because so many of the jobs, um, so many more jobs and organizations are dependent on some fragment of tourism spending. For example, um, if you look at jobs in Hampshire County that are dependent on visitors, that number is over 4,000 jobs. And to put this in context, there's about 600 hotel jobs in the county, so that's a big number. And then more importantly, I think for all of us, more than 60% of these jobs are in the cultural sector. So these are performing arts and museums, for example, and another 40% or 40% of those are primarily independent art 
artists. So artists that are creating work that is sold in the local marketplace and the, uh, the visitor spending that is um, generated as a result of that. We know a lot more about tourism because we did become a regional tourism council. So we also know where they come from, why they come, what they do while they're here. And we have a lot more uh, capacity to pro promote the area, which is a good thing. I think you know one thing to keep in mind about how the city can support downtown is there's a looming question for us about what the impact of the casino is going to be when it opens in 2018. The mayor's study, uh, just to remind you, estimated that there would be a loss of four to eight million dollars in spending, which if you go back to that 54 million that I mentioned, visitor spending for Northampton is about a 10 to 15 percent um, amount of that spending. So that's a significant number no matter how you look at it. There's also a lot more competition for um, Massachusetts in general. New York spends five times the amount in promoting tourism than Massachusetts does. You've probably seen the ads. They're going right at Massachusetts <coughs> residents, which for all parts of Massachusetts are the number one visitor, is someone that lives somewhere else in Massachusetts. So we're very aware of that. And I, I guess the most important comment I'd like to make, again, is coming back to how dependent uh, Northampton is. It's really our lifestyle that is very dependent on tourism and what we value. And so maintaining and growing the tourism economy has more than an impact on jobs and spending. It really has a huge impact on our quality of life as an area. I mean, one way to think about it is that we can support, just think about the variety on Main Street of independent shops and restaurants and galleries. Those, that extra margin of sales that visitors generate is what can make a business viable. Without that extra margin in margin of sales that comes from the you know bringing dollars in from visitors is going to make a difference about whether that business or that organization can um, survive here or thrive here. The Academy of Music, Deborah is here, has figured out that 50,000 visitors attend events there every year. Again, supporting our very important historic landmark as well as a significant cultural institution. The fairgrounds, another important place uh, in, in Northampton has a full schedule of events that brings visitors to the area that spend money um, and help all of us as a result. I've already mentioned the tax revenues that the city receives every year. So I'm glad that you wanted to know more about tourism. Obviously, we have a lot of, of that we know a lot about the economy now, and I'm happy to provide more information, but I figured that was probably enough to throw at you tonight. I'll uh, give you a little flyer that has some stats. Um, and in particular, on the back of this is an actual profile of who comes and why they come. And I'll just give those to you. So What's thank the you. average length of a visit? It depends on um, it depends on who, but it, well, it, it ranges from one to three days um, to an average of three to seven nights. One to three nights to three, three to seven nights, depending on. Um, and I don't know from a hotelier's perspective. What they what their answer would be, but they would have a more much more specific. Answer. Do you say the majority of visitors are from within Massachusetts? Our number one market is Massachusetts, followed by New York, and then Connecticut. Uh, New York and Metro and, and Metro New Jersey, followed by Connecticut. So, and, but Massachusetts is like a third of our market, and I think New York is and Metro New Jersey is about twenty five percent, something like that. We draw most of our visitors from the south. But that's our just the way our economy works, let alone our travel economy, but that's where we draw them from. Um, when you're talking, oh, I'm so sorry. No, it's great. Right. Let me move it up. Um, when you're talking about the money, so the casino, yes. and when you're talking about the percentage that would be taken from that 54 million, is that, do we feel like it would come from that tourism market? I mean, I assume that a, a, some of the hit that Northampton would take would be from, if not local residents, but you know, regional residents. That's true. So that may not be the right equation to make, but four to eight million dollars in our size economy, when particularly when it's concentrated downtown, is kind of the, this kind of spending is a lot of money. Okay. Sorry, Councilor Clark. I just wanted to clarify one of the um, things you told us. I think you said that um, Deborah at the Academy has said that 50,000 uh, visitors come to the Academy. So those are people that are coming more from more than 50 miles away, right? Per year. Yeah, the standard definition of this. It's not just people. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is 
so with with the increased activity of the regional tourism council, it, 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 is, is it any ability to tell impact of, 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 of upgraded promotional activity? So the t tourism council um, really its full first full year was three years ago. So it's and we our average grant is about two hundred thousand dollars, which we spend on marketing the area. If we look at hotel occupancy as a measure of um, you know, what are we moving the needle? We've been fairly flat at 55% on average for a year, which is low compared to the rest of Massachusetts. Uh, and by far our biggest challenge is getting people to know that we exist. Um, the Berkshires are well known, you know this, the Berkshires, the Cape and the Islands, Boston, that's what everybody thinks of as Massachusetts. And uh, even if you live, you know, from Worcester East, um, so our biggest challenge is just hammering away on who, who we are, what you can do here. And we're, we're definitely making, we're making particular inroads in the travel media of bringing them here because they feel like they're discovering a new place, spending some time here and then writing about it. Um, and that is kind of foundational in terms of trying to make an impact on those numbers, um, you know, the economic numbers. in the city for actually uh, doing the publicity and advertising the outreach? Is it a mixture of all of the above mentioned places or how does that work? <coughs> so the, the, I should have said at the outset that Hampshire County Regional Tourism Council is a collaboration of the Amherst, East Hampton and North Hampton Chambers of Commerce because there was no Hampshire County organization to set it in. Um, so the you know, marketing, there aren't a lot of businesses or organizations that can afford to market outside the area. Because in order to do that, you have to be there all the time um, and invest, quite frankly, uh, more money than would make sense that for you that you would get back from that particular segment of your, of your organization or business. So the value of the Tourism Council is that it's every year ongoing marketing of the area. And we obviously promote the entire region and specifically those the areas that people are most interested in, which happens now to be breweries and wineries. <laughs> so it's good that we have a lot of them because they are really popular. But um, you know, destinations like Northampton, downtown Northampton, are um, you know some of our biggest assets to promote. But so it's um, the chamber, the um, is it called the. Hampshire County Regional Tourism, Tourism Council. Tourism yes. Council. Yeah. And then Terry Masterson's office, I would imagine, is also involved in some of this. Yeah. Um, so those are the three main. And I, and I would add the Downtown North Hampton Association once it gets up and running. They're going to be a really important uh, partner. And the, the chamber um, contribution aside from providing the administrative support and overhead for the um, Tourism Council is the operation of our visitor center which is a very, very busy place. It's open seven days a week from May through October. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Happy to follow up if you're interested. Okay, thank you. Um, Pat Goggins is the next name. Right. Hi. Hi. I'm uh, Pat Doggins, uh, Doggins Real Estate, 79 King Street uh, property in North Hampton. And I wondered, uh, since I was here at the uh, first form, uh, I wonder if it might not be useful to kind of give an update on uh, some of that information that I provided you with then to uh, kind of counter some of the impressions that, it, that I felt were. Uh, being left uh, uh, in the community about uh, the condition of, of downtown people with respect to uh, leasing of property. And, um, and, and I, I, my reason for feeling as though it's important to keep you updated on this is you contemplate uh, what you're going to be uh, crafting for recommendations. Uh, I think it's always best to you deal with as many specifics as you can rather than annual oh, comments that people might have or impressions that might um, be quite 
quite different from what we're actually seeing. Uh, if you remember, I uh, spoke to you about the fact that I was concerned uh, late last fall uh, about what I saw as a number of uh, vacancies in the greater Main Street area um, that were resulting in storefronts that I was being asked to uh, help lease, as well as uh, a number of others uh, of other properties that I was involved with conversations about people that I knew to be coming after the first of the year, after the holiday season, as is often the case. And that seemed to be a number that was in excess of what I had seen in, in the past, and so I was trying to uh, weigh what impact that was going to have and how the community might absorb uh, those vacancies and what timelines um, might be affected in terms of the pace of the market. Um, and so, you know, as you take a look at any uh, glimpse at downtown at any point in time, it can leave a different impression. And, and there's certainly been a number of those impressions that have been uh, kicked around and, and with the suggestion that this is an indication of that or that that's an indication of this. Well, over that period of time that I just described to you from the late fall until now, I've had uh, nine properties to handle. Uh, and as of last week, the final one uh, was leased. Uh, and, and that, for instance, incidentally, is a, a Happy Valley space right across the street here, which is moving laterally down the street to Hempest and <coughs> concern about that. And, and I thought it would be helpful to kind of characterize to a certain extent in a general way without a lot of specifics um, who those people are. Uh, in three quarters of the, those uh, cases, those are people moving from the outside in, moving into the community with new and different ideas about uh, what might be uh, well accepted in this community for a uh, product. You know, there's some people that are some real estate, some people are selling widgets, some people have different things to sell, and they come here with, with uh, generally with a lot of enthusiasm uh, because of the reputation that this wonderful community has for, for being so vibrant. And uh, so the people who are moving from the outside in have a lot of eclectic and, and unusual kinds of, of, of products that they're going to be uh, trying to uh, uh, guys in, in our community and I think that that's that kind of change and and, uh, and uh, new opportunities is, is good for the community in addition to that we've had the Harvest Valleys and we've had the Birdhouse Music and others that have moved laterally you know in and around the greater downtown area and this has been something that has happened um, over the years for quite some time and a lot of it has to do with Thorns and the fact that that's kind of an incubator for many businesses to look beyond uh, Thorns for other opportunities and that, that's been a continuing pattern that we've seen over the years and one I think that suggests a certain amount of vibrancy as well. And I think that's important to kind of keep in mind also. Uh, Terry Masterson submitted, and I'm sure some of you saw uh, within the last two weeks, uh, an update of some economic downtown economic data that he's been collecting relative to the number of uh, storefront vacancies and so forth. And I think he, he quoted nine or so as a total number at that point in time. Well, it would be eight now, at least as far as I know, because of the Happy Valley circumstances that I've described already. And he also suggested, of course, that, uh, that one of those, uh, one of the contributing factors was that so many of those properties were under the control of one party. And, uh, you know, that's going to happen. That's the, you know, that's, people have choices as to what they're going to do and how they're going to handle their property. But um, for those who suggested that that isn't any indication of uh, a negative impression that is coming out of the community, albeit confusing, I must, must admit it is confusing, um, uh, I think that that is not creating the kind of consternation that you might think uh, would be expected to develop with something um, as obvious as those storefronts that we all like to see built. And um, so, so I'm, I'm sorry, that was just the tone. So it's been five minutes. So if, if you okay. have like another quick thought, um, otherwise, I'm, I'm sure we all have some questions for you. I apologize. 
Go ahead. I don't have a time limit. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Ben, you're welcome to wrap up if you were wrapping that's, up. That's, that's what's up. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, does anyone? Yes. Sure. Um, you referred to, to, to Thorns and its long time role as an incubator space. Um, are there are there other area? Are you seeing enough other parts of, of, of Northampton? At, at, at a, I'm very happy for Thorns in terms of its price point, but are there are there other areas? In, in the city with a, a, a lesser rental point that are affordable for, 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 for startups. I, I know it Yeah. It, 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 yeah, it, it, it takes a mix of that lower price incubator space to really make yeah. the whole thing go. Yeah. Would, um, we still have it? We do. We do. I mean, I would. Uh, I can show you uh, uh, information from my files, Dennis, that, uh, that many of the properties that I just suggested to you over this period of time that I've been describing this, uh, were rented at the same per square foot price as they were 10 years ago. Now some people might say, well, that's a big surprise. Uh, I think we were ahead of the curve in terms of where we needed to be 10 years ago, fueled by a lot of things that were um, wrong with our world that ended up being part of the economic downturn that we all experienced. And it took a while for me to figure that out. but. Uh, to the extent that I've had any influence over that conversations that I had with, with uh, people asking for my opinions about what they might be able to uh, get for a rent. Uh, I've um, been comfortable suggesting that that rent that existed 10 years ago and is uh, something that is still in place. And, and I think it's a more accurate reflection of how businesses really need to, to um, uh, approach their business plan. When we all went to buy our first houses, the lender that was lending us the money said, you know, you can only develop 30% of your of your uh, income per month to servicing the debt on that new home that you're going to be buying. We all remember that discussion. It's really no different with uh, with uh, uh, business properties. Yeah. You can't afford to pay as a function of your total expenses more than really 30% or so. Of, of that monthly expense devoted to rent, or else it's a recipe for disaster. And yet, many of the places downtown uh, that I'm, I've become familiar with are 30, 40, 50, or more percent as a function of the total expenses. That contributes to problems for a lot of businesses. And, you know, and so people ask me the, as if I should know what I'm talking about, what, uh, what uh, the rent should be, and so, I feel quite comfortable suggesting a rent that, in fact, when you look at it over a span of time, is really uh, very close to what it was in many cases 10 years ago. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, other counselors? Okay. Thank you. I, have, I have one more. If you would uh, yeah, I have one, but do you want to go first? Um, when people are, are interested in, in leasing properties that you're familiar with, what are like the number one concerns that they have, or what are the things that they talk about the most? If they're, if they're looking to kind of have, if they're looking to start a business here in Northampton, what are what are the sort of the top of the mind things that they want to ask you? About? They ask me which side of the street has the greatest traffic <laughs> patterns. They ask me if What's uh, the answer. <laughs> 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 body of knowledge in his head here. <laughs> uh, and uh, they ask uh, uh, how the uh, community has been doing. There's a lot of people who come here well informed as potential tenants having Googled Northampton Mass and they see some of the uh, concerns that have been raised of uh, differences of opinion that have been bandied about in the recent years of development <coughs> of downtown and they ask what that's about. And there's always, you know, if you try to stay well informed, you can answer those questions pretty well. The DNA is a good, uh, it's just certainly a step in the right direction as far as many of us are concerned. And uh, yet there's an importance to maintaining a certain uh, um, approach to our greater downtown businesses and uh, and so you know I explain that to them they ask uh, often about uh, about uh, uh, the busiest times of the year questions like that 
Um, what I'm finding is that uh, well, there's a sharp distinction, quite frankly, between um, those capable potential tenants who come into town with a business plan in mind and a banking relationship already established or in a position to be able to capitalize their businesses properly, and those who see these streets as paved with gold and would like to be here but really can't pull it together in a way that, uh, but that's that, that's not anything recent. That's always been the case. We've, uh, we've had this impression from the outside in that, that sometimes it's a little difficult to match up with reality or at least with a potential tenant's ability to uh, participate in the community because of their own limitations. What about like fees or um, you know, things that the city is involved in? You know, we, we just, as you know, went through this um, as the city council the second time that we voted on water and sewer fees, the first time that we actually changed the structure and the fees, which was a very long, in-depth public discussion. Um, and we heard from a lot of businesses and we heard often, you know, we've heard a lot of people say that uh, they feel like the city, um, the city's fees are are a big part of you know their expenditures. Yeah. Um, do you find that people are concerned about that when they come and talk no. about? I can't remember other than possibly a few restaurant potential restaurant tenants who even brought it up. I think that was a that was a co co coincidental occurrence as a result of the discussions that were going on in the community and a few other things that were happening at the same time and time and people um, melded the two arguments and, and I, I don't see that as a, an issue because it's expressed to me by those looking to come to town or asking such questions if you have some support. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry, sure. Um, you mentioned bank relationships and bank financing. What, 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 are the, what are the trends you're seeing there with regard to availability of financing for startups who don't necessarily yeah. come with their financing already lined up? But yeah. what do you, what do you yeah. see? Well, if you look at it over the span of time, and I think that you know those of us who were involved in, in the change that took place in the community in the 70s uh, would probably agree uh, that uh, what helped uh, that entrepreneurial spirit that brought a lot of this change that we are now enjoying to, to the greater downtown area was accompanied by willing lenders, in most cases local lenders. We have fewer local lenders than we've uh, ever had really in, in recent years and a lot of that lending is done, um, the underwriting for such lending is done outside the immediate area. So it kind of, uh, impacts on people who are in need of help. You know, the old expression, the only people that commercial banks are lending money to are those that don't need it. Because it isn't, there's a bit of an exaggeration here, but I mean, that, that's, it's very different uh, from how it was in the 70s and 80s when there was a lot of willing participation on the part of banks in the, uh, in the emergence of the greater downtown area. I wanted to ask about um, downtown Florence. I think you more than anyone can kind of share your impressions mm. and you did the last time you were here, right. but we haven't heard from anyone else about the center of Florence and I'm just wondering what yeah. you're thinking is these days. I know that building at right. the corner there still has a Yes, we like them. <laughs> we actually have we have capital that went right the first floor. The second floor is when that is that's the that? hundred Main Street New right. Jersey. I thought the part of the problem with that building was that they, that this is a gas moratorium. Mm. No. That's been solved. Oh, great. Yeah, no. Sorry. The problem is that it costs just as much to build that building in the center of Florence as it, it does in the center of Northampton, <laughs> and the rents in the center of Florence are not even half of what you get in the center of Northampton. So that's the challenge for someone such as the owner who's a, you know, uh, uh, committed to uh, bringing what Florence needs to that building. And I'll just give you a quick example. And so he had a pizza hut, gave him a, 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 an offer on that building, exactly what he was asking for, pizza, national credit tenant. He said no, because he was, well, he's right. He thought there's enough pizza places already, and he didn't, <laughs> and he didn't want to, uh, and he didn't want to affect their, the businesses of his, you know, fellow downtown Florence business people. So that's the kind of guy he is, and and, and that 
position that he's held now for the better part of the year. He's been ready to fire his realtor. Um, is uh, that he would like to get a restaurant in there because he thinks Florence needs a restaurant. So he's been holding out for the restaurant and um, hasn't worked yet. So, uh, but but the, the issue with with Florence is Florence is, 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 is a, you know it's a it serves people's needs. It, 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 it has the kind of businesses there that people can go and get what they need, and, and it's not a wander around kind of place. It's not a boutique kind of place where you have something to eat and then wander around downtown. You go where you're going, get what you need, and go back. And so uh, the rents are a reflection of that. And uh, it, at the same time, provides a lot of what the people who live that in the town, including myself. Um, what? So, uh, but it, uh, it's, it's challenging to get uh, good rents there. You know the two new places in Wilson Oaks since we saw you last, the, yes. the, the Tisco restaurant and the brewery. Yes. So I'm wondering if you're seeing that as a kind of trend for so. particular direction? I hope so. I, I hope so. I mean, it's a, the place that the restaurant went into is, was vacant for better part of almost five years and so the brewery on the other hand uh, I think <laughs> it's probably not a good shot um, you know but uh, yeah it's uh, it's just different you know, and, and those are the kind of things that you have to be aware of when you're making any kind of uh, judgment on the South in general because it doesn't do one of them it's uh, yeah. you need to take other than consideration but the main point of, of being here beyond my five minutes appreciate the chance to share this with you but uh, is it you know we're we've got some things going on downtown that leave an impression that we have to be able to be prepared to counter because it's a, these are logical questions that are asked <coughs> at the same time I think it is a single set of circumstances involving um, um, one property owner that that contribute to a lot of that confusion and uh, at the same time, um, that, that same property owner has put a lot of money into this community and that's something else that can't be ignored. This is a, you know, it's, everyone has their own way of doing things. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, yeah, so there's no one else signed up, but anyone else who would like to be test first and then, okay. Thanks. Hi, my name is Tess Throne Poe, 32 Masonic Street. I'm usually here wearing my Beehive sewing hat, but tonight I'm going to wear a little bit of a different hat uh, and hopefully touch on some things that haven't been touched on yet. Um, I own two condos on Masonic Street. I've lived in one since 2010, and we're currently expanding to combine the two units into a unit that's a better size for our family. In 2010, we were turned down by 11 banks until Northampton Cooperative opted to lend to us. We were moving back to the area of Cambridge, and that was crazy. After the fifth and sixth and seventh bank said, no way, uh, we probably should have packed it in and said, let's get a house in East Hampton. And, but we didn't. We wanted to live in downtown Northampton. And the reason that we were turned down so much, despite you know meeting a requirement for a 20% down payment, this and that, um, there were two reasons. The first was buying a residential condo in a mixed use building, which is a very risky consideration for a lot of lenders, both national, regional, and local. Um, and the second was the low owner occupancy in our building. We were prepared to buy a condo unit and move in and be the only owner occupants. Um, as owner occupants here in Northampton, we invest about $5,000 a year in property taxes and an additional $4,500 in condo fees. And that's a sizable investment. I'm not even counting all the, the coffees and the ice cream cones that we spend downtown. Um, but I think when we talk about the local economy, you often don't hear that folks are really valuing the contribution that residential and commercial owner occupants in downtown are making to the city. And that's a really important aspect of how we, we generate revenue for the city. This is different from absentee landlords. There are lots of absentee landlords in our building. That's great, it's an investment for them. Um, but they approach their units as investments, and that's it. And they're not spending disposable income downtown. They may live in California, they may live in Hadley, but nevertheless, there's, there is a different sense of, of their contribution 
to the local economy. Um, talking about being in downtown Northampton is great, but there is another strategy that I just want to raise that will contribute to making Northampton a more attractive place for owner occupants, and that's code enforcement. And I know that the city is spread thin, but things like building codes, zoning codes, health codes, which govern things like on-site trash and recycling, day-to-day -day things, fire code that protect our health and safety, these are things that, that make the case for Northampton being worth the investment of living downtown. And I think there's a really interesting opportunity to look at some of the other cities that might be similar to Northampton, to look at in Ithaca or Princeton and see how their capacity for code enforcement might be the same or different from Northampton's. And if there is a gap there, maybe we can look to fill it specifically for the central business district because there is something really valuable about, you know, both economically but also socially about having folks who are committed to building their lives in the center of town. And I think, I think that's all I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, so is it, do you think, do you think the codes as they stand are good, solid codes, they just need to be enforced, or would you, do you think they should be reviewed? They're just not enforced. I mean, there's like 9,000 codes, right? So like, I think <laughs> I'm sure there are some that are great. Um, so for the most part, they're good. I think the big issue does have to do with um, with enforcement and, and not uh, a lack of interest in enforcement. But again, I think you know this is a small city, and you know, we're not Portland, Oregon. We don't have a staff of hundreds, you know, municipally. And I think um, I think staff is probably stretched. I also think that, you know, when we, there's this balance between folks who are able to make an investment and buy a building, like the building that Beehive Sewing is in was just sold to a, a family that owns a number of different properties. So the entire building, that's four commercial units, and I think it's eight or 10, apartments, you know, was sold as a group. Um, they're very committed to maintaining it, but that's one model of property ownership. And the individual condominium units that we have in town is, is another model. And so making sure that individual owners are following code and that that's being enforced, and then when they don't, there's some incentive or disincentive um, to not, you know, be contributing to a quality of life that is degraded. I mean, you know, we're, we're committed, but then there's there's moments where we think, what are we doing? You know, when, when there's you know people flouting sandwich board, fire code, and trash. You know, it's like that's the stuff that that is on the city, and things like you know the marketing and the things that the NA is doing. Those are wonderful things that contribute to you know our our more amorphous quality of life and how nice it is to have guests here and have our families come visit. And, and things like that. But at the end of the day, we're, we're making a very substantial monetary investment annually that's far surpasses the number of ice cream cones I could eat. You know, it's a whole order of magnitude bigger than, than what we could spend just in disposable income if we weren't property owners. So I'm wondering what you think about other things besides commerce in the downtown or Hampton areas incentivizing people to be owner occupants is with you know more parks or pocket parks that we've talked about or other kinds of things like that, things that you think would create create a more kind of hospitable downtown for mm -hmm. people to actually live in downtown? That's a great question. I, you know, there's always gonna be amenities like that that make things great, but to be very honest, you know, exactly what I've said is, is what I mean. I think that the day-to-day, -day, you know, code enforcement and, and the day-to-day -day idea that as part of an economic development strategy, we recognize individual owner occupancy and property ownership in our central business district, um, that goes a long way. You know, it's, there are very, very few buildings here in town where people, that people live in that have really beautiful entrances. And when you walk around and catalog what it looks like for people who live downtown to walk into their home, it's pretty depressing. You know, the, the, there's a lot of sad looking doorways that lead to homes that are probably very nice, but you know, they're in a sentiment of encouraging, you know, people to own and live downtown. It's still, you know, a bit of an afterthought and it's it's still people still look at us like we have three heads when we say, you know, we're we added another condo unit because we want to stay downtown as opposed to moving outside of town and having to get a second car and all that stuff. Um, but, you know, I think the 
city is, is right on track with amenities like parks and shopping and cultural areas and you know the Holly Street project. The, you know, there's all sorts of wonderful projects going on that will increase our quality of life. But the day to day stuff, the things that are already on the books that are there to make people's quality of life good, um, sometimes go unnoticed. Just that you raise a good point about enforcement. Um, we do have a system that's complaint based, so it's a little, you know, I, I think. Have you had the experience of filing any complaint mm -hmm. and had it not? Sadly. Met? Oh, um, well, it's interesting. You know, there's um, yes, but not not because of municipal folks. I mean, there's, you know, there's a complaint. You can file a complaint, but at the end of the day, it's on the the property owner who is being who is responsible for creating a violation to rectify that, right. and I think there is a point at which there, there's a long period of time it takes. You know, when we've spent probably several thousand dollars in legal fees just to try to navigate a multi-owner mixed-use condominium building to, to enforce codes. You know, before going the complaint route, because who wants to complain, right? Right. Right. So. So yeah, I wouldn't say it's um, it's the, the fault of you know individuals or the city government, but I do think that there may be a lack of capacity. And, you know, I do think that it's reasonable to say that the central business district needs a little bit more attention or priority, you know, rather than kind of broad brush saying there's X thousands of parcels in the city. How do we make sure that they're all compliant? You know, maybe it maybe it isn't complaint based in the CBD. Maybe you know there is a zoning enforcement officer who is able to, to go around and, and log violations and such and be more proactive. You know, that's what we do with parking enforcement. We don't wait for somebody to call and say meter is, is out. Um, you know, we proactively enforce those those codes. Okay. Um, I just want to call attention to the, the role of owner-occupied uh, residences downtown. I, I, I do appreciate that. It's kind of overlooked and mixed sometimes. And thank you for your uh, investment in downtown and your perseverance in pursuing bank financing to, mm -hmm. to, to, to not, oh, yeah. not give it up People thought we were nuts, and we're going to be cooperative as they great, so we were really appreciative of them. So. Good. Thank Thanks. Has had an arts 
an office, and um, certainly the city never developed one, but we are developing this and creating this for the community. Um, the city has been supportive when we have been applying for grants. Um, we've gotten letters from the mayor, from Terry Masterson, from, um, from Wayne Fodden. Um, this is a big project, it's a multi-million dollar project. We're, um, we're about, from acquisition through our phase two of our three, of our three phases of construction, we're about halfway there, we still have a ways to go. Um, we haven't really received a lot of help from the city in terms of brainstorming how to bring this uh, into uh, reality, <laughs> uh, or to completion, I should say, because it already is a reality. Um, uh, it's, uh, I know the city's proud of it, I know they're excited about it, I think, I know that they think it's a great thing for this part of town, um, but sometimes, um, you know, frankly, we felt a little like that's what we get, <laughs> you know. Uh, um, in the fall, Peter Kokot convened a meeting with a number of different organizations, Western Mass Culture, uh, Western Mass Economic Development Council, Mass Development, uh, <coughs> Governor's office is there, Senator, uh, I mean, Congressman Governor's office, Senator um, um, Warren's office had representatives there, the mayor was invited. The city wasn't there. I, should have said that. I don't know if that was an oversight or what happened. So, you know, that was disappointing to us. So, just, you know, Did you invite city council? We didn't invite city council. There's not so many people you can kind of put, put in a room. Uh, but, you know, this is going to be a really great thing for the city. It's uh, it's going to be a real, I think, a real game changer. We're going to talk a lot about uh, tourism and uh, um, people coming to town, which is a big group of people come to town from far away and from from the city itself. I mean, people coming in. There'll be people in and out of this building all day long. Uh, classes, exhibits, um, events, performances, specials. <laughs> uh, Dorothy, what, what's the, in, in your face, where does the, the, the black box? The black box, is, unfortunately, is space that, It's a 3,800 3. square foot space, and there's two, there's a number of reasons why. It, it's a, it's sort of a separate space, so that was easy to kind of, kind of finish and but hold on to um, in terms of our fundraising. But also because we, uh, we met with, um, Early on, we had a meeting with the theater community, very, uh, very aspects of the theater community, and they felt that we should keep it a draw space to start, so that they could really decide in a collaborative process what what should go in there. Should you have intake seating? Where should the control booth be? Should there be a catwalk? What kind of a lighting structure do you want? Not a theater person myself, but these are all. Um, you you don't want to deliver something to the community that then they don't know. There's an outlet. Um, so there'll be an opportunity once sort of the walls are in, you know, there'll be walls, there'll be light, there'll be heat, uh, there'll be a sprinkler system, but it, it won't be fully functional. But, you know, people can get in there and, and really see what it's like. Um, I, I also want to say we're having a couple of events outside the building this summer, so I'm just going to color over that. On, uh, on August 10th, there's a, a poetry thing going on. Uh, Chris Gonzalez is one of our young uh, dynamic city artists is putting that on. And then on August 17th, we're having a movie night that NCTV is. is um, so uh, we cleaned up some of our back lot with proceeds from Valdez and we're, we're uh, doing that out there. And that's an opportunity to come in and see the building. And I encourage everybody to do it because it's fantastic. Um, are there flyers or something for those events? There will be. There will be. Okay. Pursue something that I kind of started a conversation with Richard about um, pursuing um, the community preservation committee. Yes, Richard's going to talk. Richard, yeah, yeah, Richard's going to talk to that. Yeah, because that's a okay. little more. Um, that's a little more involved. And that's actually a statewide initiative. Although I, I will talk about that a little bit because at this meeting that that Peter Kokov convened, somebody and I'm not going to remember exactly, but I might have been the person from Mass Development talked about the way. Um, uh, we do know that the Community Preservation uh, Act does not cover these kind of projects because we're not historic, and we should talk more about this, we are not a historic building, we're not affordable housing, we're not recreation, we, we can't really live all in that way. Um, open space, though, is that the Open space, space well, you know, the open space, we're going to be developing open space around the building, so that, that we may be coming, we probably definitely will come to that. But, um, but, you know, 
Otherwise, the city thought about ways of moving like that. So there's a uh, block ranch or whatever they're called now, where that could be used for affordable housing. But that money be used for affordable housing, freeing uh, up, or, or could the CPA be used for affordable, affordable housing, freeing up money in other areas that could be used for a project like this, for cultural infrastructure, for something that, I mean, we're a nonprofit, you know, and we are completely volunteer. We have no overhead at all. We, we are all doing this out of love or craziness. Um, so, you know, we are really giving this huge gift to the city and to the community. And, um, you know, so. Thank you for your love and your creativity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, does anyone else have questions? Or just say thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to sound churlish. I just want to, you know, put, put out what's, what, what's out there. So. We appreciate it. And, you know, always feel free to come to us, mm -hmm. you know, for if you're looking for involvement, um, you know, it's only a couple Yeah, we probably should have, but it was, you know, the, the, like I said, we're, we are all volunteer, and we, we, we learn as we go along, and uh, we, we, we wouldn't make that mistake again, I think. So, so. so I mean, you know, start capital campaign for the better, has a lot of information about the organization and the, the building and all that. So, and again, I encourage you to, you know, get in touch and come on down. Right. You've seen it, but yeah. you should see it again because yeah. it's. Uh, I pass by it every day, but yeah. I haven't been. When you come inside, you can really see it all. Take my shape now. Yeah. Just a shout. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um for sure. Good, good. 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 Um, so what I want to talk about is the frame, uh, because we on the trust and everybody and people in town also, I think, you know, you get really focused on the building because you can see it and that's like, that's the thing, that's what we're working for. But it's within a bigger frame and part of the Artist Trust mission is to try and um, you know, start a discussion of, of, of how does art interact with community, how do you build community with art, um, or the better term is creativity, um, from my point of view. Um, creativity within a community leads to a community that has lots of clever people. Clever people that can be on boards, clever people that can be counselors. So it's something to be nurtured, to be um, encouraged. So if a community buys into that, and I think Northampton has, um, in large part because of the economic argument, um, this notion of a creative economy, being able to lift the rest of, a, of an economy of the town. Um, how do you support that? Um, in Massachusetts, very clearly the state believes in the creative economy notion. We have cultural districts, we have Paradise City Cultural District. Um, how, you know, how do you support that? How do you nurture it? What does it need? Like everything else, it needs money. Um, and so one of the things that we've been trying to develop, and now it's just been through informal conversations um, with people I come across at meetings, people I come across at conferences, is, is uh, looking at the CPA and the CPA Act as something that allows a community to impart, um, define itself by putting money into things that it values. Right now, that's been defined in four very specific areas. Um, and um, we've been trying to start a conversation about opening it up to a fifth, which is cultural infrastructure. Um, don't ask me to define that. That's for smarter people than me, lawyers and such. But the notion being that right now, um, and this is across the state, um, Right now, say you're in the library that was built in 1975, it's got a leaky roof. Can you get see? It's obviously a cultural asset. It's something the community wants to support. Um, if the building has been built in 1975, they can go to the store and help fix their roof. Built in 1975, you can't. You don't have that same flexibility. Um, so what we're thinking of is going to uh, <coughs> approaching this in the sense of going to CBA committees and just saying, look, we're interested in offering you a way to have more choices at work, um, to be able to fund things 
that you can fund them now. Um, and I'm throwing this out as a notion. Uh, I made, I talked short, uh, I had a little uh, presentation in front of Northampton's um, CPA committee when they were doing a review for the year. Um, directed uh, at, a, at a more uh, a thing over in Amherst <coughs> where there were um, uh, a couple house members. She made a little presentation. They were actually surprised to find out that cultural um, infrastructure wasn't funded. Um, so it's just it's something I want to throw out to you so that you know that we're working on it. It's an idea we're pushing. It's an idea we're proposing. And I think it's nice for the town of Northampton um, if it can be associated with it. Because Northampton really is, people hold that up as, as you know, here's the creative economy at work. It's been a leader in that. Um, and I think it'd be great statewide for Northampton to be seen as a leader in a new, pro not a new program, but a new approach. Um, to, fund, to funding infrastructure, not programming infrastructure. So that's all I have. Do you have any other questions? No, I mean, that's what I wanted, I wanted to update about that as, a, as an approach and a way to kind of, I mean, I, I guess I am curious about what the policy steps are, the, in place or the policy advocacy steps in place are to kind of try and shift the at the state level the way in which community preservation is in fact framed and discussed. Yeah. So it sounds like there's been a local beginning of that conversation, but beyond. Well, I've had conversations you know, like with Representative Coco. I've had conversations with people from the Mass Cultural Council because I didn't want to be stepping on their toes, as it were. I've had discussions with folks from Mass Creative. Um, the, an interesting metric is that um, the overlap of, of local cultural councils with communities that are signed on to the CPA is maybe 85% or so. Um, I'm interested in developing uh, some talking points or something such that local um, uh, local cultural councils could go to their CPA members and just have a conversation of like, what do you think about this? Um, I'm sort of interested in getting a grassroots uh, reaction to the notion from the people that are actually in the mix. Um, is Matt Wilson and all of his folks kind of behind this idea and helping um, kind of create some frame for it? Currently, right now, Mass Creative is, since Boston is, is in the midst of deciding whether or not to become a CPA community, Mass Creative at the moment is more, they want to align themselves with let's become a CPA community as opposed to <coughs> let's divide four-way pie into five. First, they want to become a community. So that's the last conversation I had with Matt. That's where he sort of was, but he was like, please, go, you know, do what you can. Um, but that's specifically because of the situation in Boston at the moment. Um, but uh, like folks on the, on the uh, cultural council, um, Indiana Walker, the executive director, and Jay Padgett, who's a um, program director for the uh, facilities fund, they were both they were both solidly behind the idea. Um, and, and if I need names of cultural councils, et cetera, it will help. Um, at some point, I have to touch base with the CPA coalition um, to see what they might suggest as an approach. To that but I mean, basically, I know what I mentioned it to is the Indian Arts or the funding world um, has been supportive. And, and as have the local CPA. And that's where we stand, like Dorothy said, we're a current volunteer group, so, um, you know, you sort of do things as you can. So, that's all. Is there, is there a way that we can help you or give ideas for other than sort of spreading that idea or yes. floating that idea? Are, are there things that you think we could do to help bolster it? Yeah, well, it's a step-by-step -step strategy of like, how do you take this idea and get it State House and how do you start pushing legislation? So I'm not, we're not there. Um, we have to figure that out. Um, right now, like I said, right now I'm sort of curious to get feedback of how people think of, of what people think of the notion of the idea. Um, because I think it would be handy to know that you know, a lot of CPA communities, they think it's a good idea. Because the bottom line is you're taking a pie that's being cut four ways and slicing it five. Someone's going to be threatened by that. 
possible. I don't know if that's the case. So, Thank you. My name is Rich Reynolds. I'm uh, an ownership interest in Forbes Marketplace, uh, Cedar Chest, Hampshire Property Management Group, and the Anderson Way Subdivision in North Hampton. I'd just like to say a few comments real briefly. Uh, first, I'd like to commend Pat and uh, this broker, J uh, Jamie Fallon, on leasing up all these storefronts in Northampton. I'd also like to share that we've had two storefronts that uh, recently turned over, one on Crafts Avenue where Glazed Donuts is coming in, another on Strong Avenue where Ibiza is located where we have uh, two sets of very young, energetic entrepreneurs. We've also leased up 139 King Street, which is where Hamlin Furniture used to be. So. The demise of Northampton retail and the storefronts that's been well publicized, I think, is uh, greatly uh, exaggerated. And the, the real facts are is that there's a lot of leasing activity. I have an empty uh, space in Florence right now. We have multiple tenants that are prospects and looking for space. So there's a lot of energy. Um, that doesn't mean it's all positive. I mean, part of the reason there's turnover is some of the uh, retailers have failed. It's very challenging. And, environment both for retailers and restaurateurs. The Amazon effect is no mystery to anybody. I'd also like to just say congratulations on uh, the Arts Trust. That's a, an amazing project for Northampton. It really has a positive, will have a tremendously positive effect. Um, I think one of the, the challenges that we have uh, as a business in downtown Northampton is the gauntlet of solicitors. I know when I'm leasing space, that's one of the main objections that I get, or people look at storefronts, they see somebody saying, 25 cents, uh, please, on the next storefront. And that's uh, a tremendous uh, discouragement for potential uh, retail tenants. It may not seem apparent to everybody in this room, but it really has a pretty devastating effect for, for what I do, at least on the, on the uh, leasing end. Um, I talked, uh, I had the opportunity to talk in one of your previous forums, and I talked about death by a thousand cuts, and I'd just like to give you an example of the last few weeks. Last week, I received something from uh, the regulatory authorities in the city of Hampton that had a display case that's been on our building that advertises in medical offices. And they basically quoted a regulation that says that it's, it's not legal to advertise a business that's not in a building. Now this use has been in place for two decades, but it seems like the regulations are now being enforced. I'm not saying it's a good or bad regulation, just giving an example of that display case produced uh, around $700 worth of income a year, and that's disappeared. The week before, we had an incident where we had a couple of uh, vagrants on a roof. Uh, it's a building that had a skylight in it, and it had a 25-year-old uh, resident in there that looked up and saw two vagrants. Uh, the police department reacted very quickly as they normally do, but they said they couldn't take any action until we put a no trespass sign on top of our roof <laughs> to display that uh, vagrants couldn't go on our roof. And that's the kind of regulatory feel that just seems anti-business. And you know, if, if you took it to another level, you'd have to put a no trespass sign in your living room when you had a couple of thieves that were in there stealing your, your, your TV. It's kind of a regu regulation that just isn't logical. So when, I, when we talk about death by a thousand cuts, that was the last two weeks of cuts, basically. Um, I get to travel a lot through New England. I do a lot of loose prospecting. And I, I really honestly feel that Northampton has perhaps the most uh, inhospitable streetscape with all the solicitors and the gauntlet of people there. And I think when Suzanne touched on tourism, I think that's an incredibly important component and can't be underestimated. And I can tell you those tourists that are high income folks, they have lots of choices. And after they visit the streetscape of Northampton, I suspect that if you did a survey, you'd find out that many of them weren't coming out because they felt uncomfortable about being panhandled and asked for money. Now, I know that people in this room have sort of 
watered down the effect of panhandlers and solicitors, but I can tell you firsthand that it really has a dramatic effect in many ways, one of which is capital allocation. When I look at the investment that we made in Cedar Chest, and then I look at somebody outside our door saying 25 cents to all my customers as they walk out, it doesn't really engender a feeling that the investment that you made was a wise one. And I think that I, I'm more public about it, but I know that that sentiment is widely conveyed by a lot of retailers, many of which don't want to be in a public forum or want to stay under the radar. But I think that that feeling, that sentiment that I'm conveying is very widely uh, felt by the business community. I'd also like to say that the people that are coming into town are young entrepreneurs. They're very energetic and I wish them all the success in the world. Um, what are your suggestions for dealing with Panhandling? Well, if you take New England and you sort of rank where Northampton is, Northampton might be the, in my opinion, it's the single worst town and if you take Cambridge or Boston or even New York City. Um, so whatever you're doing, it's not working. Uh, you know, I, I can't tell you specifically what to do, I'm not in your shoes, but certainly the police department seems to have a pretty friendly and uh, permissive attitude, and I don't think other communities share that. I think they view their businesses as a more important component to the economic viability of their communities than somebody saying can't 25 cents. I understand the freedom of speech argument, but I also understand a lot of people on Main Street employ a lot of people, and so it affects those businesses. And I, I really feel for people's businesses that have those panhandlers camped out in front of their place because I really do think it harms their business in a very material way. Do you think other communities are not respecting um, First Amendment rights? Whatever they're doing, they're doing a better job than the city of North Anyone else have a question? No. Thank you for Thank your time. You. And thank you for allowing the public comment. Thank you very much for thank commenting. You. Appreciate it. Hi, my name is Joe Blumenthal. I'm the owner of Downtown Sounds Music Store on Pleasant Street. I have a few things to talk about that are directly related to the city council and um, the downtown business community. And, and I'll um, start by picking up on what Richard was just talking about with the panhandling issue. I've been here for 40 years now. This has been a problem for that entire time. I can't tell you how many hours that I have spent sitting through meetings where people talk about this. We came fairly close um, just before the bid was organized to having an ordinance that would um, regulate uh, panhandling on Main Street. And I, uh, uh, it, there was a lot of very, um, nasty negative publicity um, associated with it and the whole thing was kind of dropped um, so that the city could proceed to create a business improvement district. Um, but it's been quite a few years since then and um, I think it may be time to, uh, for the city council to revisit this issue. My specific suggestion is, well, that um, while Panhandling is free speech. It needs to be regulated in a way that makes it as li the least disruptive possible to um, uh, commerce downtown. And specifically, you know, there needs to be regulation that says it has to be so many feet away from the entrance to um, a store. It has to be so many feet away from an ATM. Um, I would. Uh, so those kind, of, it has to be um, on the curb side of the sidewalk, <coughs> not close to the building, but rather close to the curb, that kind of thing. My suggestion would be for City Council to reach out to um, Bill Newman, who is going to be the most um, first and most vocal opponent to whatever you decide to do, and um, to reach out to him and say, this is something that has been a perennial problem. We know we addressed it in a way that um, didn't work a few years ago, but we think it's time to have a conversation about it again. 
and see if there's something, uh, some way that your committee and he can agree on a re on a way that panhandling could be regulated so that it would be as less disru as least disruptive to downtown commerce as possible. I don't know exactly what the answer to that is. I don't know that he would sit down and talk to you, but my guess is that he would be willing to sit down. If you could, but if you could come up with a proposal that that involved him to begin with, your chances of success with doing something about this would be um, greatly improved. I don't think there's any question that we as downtown merchants you know, who pay tens of thousands of dollars every year to rent our spaces lose a substantial amount of business because people are out there asking for 50 cents or a dollar. And it's uh, it's kind of crazy, that, uh, but, um, but that's my specific suggestion on that subject. Um, I'd also, um, I know this has come up many times, and I just, I want to kind of just mention it to reinforce, and I don't, don't want to dwell on it, but I, I'd like to commend the city council for year after year keeping the unitary tax rate in Northampton. It is um, uh, something that um, is really important to the downtown property owners to um, make sure that we can um, uh, afford to do business here and charge rents that, that merchants and tenants can afford to pay. Um, in, particularly, in particular, I would say um, the, the percentage of commercial property is small enough that to give even a tiny bout of relief to residential property owners with a dual tax rate, you would really have to drastically raise the commercial rate. And it's really a terrible idea that would really be destructive to the downtown business community. Not that I, uh, I've been told by many people, don't worry about it, but I just, I want to say we appreciate the fact that we have a single tax rate and that you recognize how important it is to our survival as um, merchants and uh, landlords. Um, the next specific thing I want to talk about is um, Pulaski Park. And um, I frankly have been um, uh, a little bit disappointed by the way the whole renovation has gone, but there is the main reason for that, um, being a the owner of a music store and being a musician and, be, and believing that, that part of what could make Northampton a much more vibrant and interesting commercial center than it is today would be the presence of live music in downtown Northampton. And um, putting music in Pulaski Park is very problematic because of the Academy of Music. Um, but you have an opportunity as probably the second stage of the renovation of Pulaski Park because you're gonna, there's going to be some kind of path going down the hill towards the parking lot. And um, if there were some kind of um, feature at the bottom of the parking lot that could be used as a band shell um, at times, and you could have people um, uh, make it possible for people to sit and listen to music on the hill as it, you have kind of, you have kind of a natural amphitheater there and it has a real possibility for um, being a good place to put live music and um, the uh, uh, because the source of the music would be down in the um, lower parking lot there um, uh, it would be unlikely to bother the Academy of Music um, Of course, I should have written down um, all the things that I was going to talk about. Uh, this. Maybe you have a question. Well, I'll note. Thank you for mentioning the tax rate. I think there's um, there's sort of this misunderstanding or misrepresentation that since we discuss the tax rate every year, which we have to because we actually have to vote on it, so we have to have a, a discussion about it, that we um, that that we want to change it because we discuss it. And that's, I, you know, I mean, I, I will only speak for myself, but I think that, you know, the points that you were making, we do all very much recognize. And we look at other communities that have a split tax rate and, and the, the, the difficulty that businesses have with it. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. I think that that's often misrepresented in terms of our, our, uh, our discussion of it. So thank you. 
I, I would say that as, as, a, as, a, as a relative newbie on the council, I've found my colleagues just falling over themselves to support the unitary tax. And I don't, I know you don't want to hear, don't worry. But, uh, uh, I, I have heard, I have talked to people about it before, but I just, I just wanted to it, bring it up and reinforce how important it is to us. That's always worth um, on the on the on the solicitation panhandling question. It, it seems to me that any solution comes down to enforcement issues. And what, what I, 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 I've heard from a number of downtown property owners, merchants, that the, the, the dedicated downtown cops are, 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 pretty, are pretty responsive. Uh, and that they, uh, in an informal way, kind of encourage people to, to be in the sort of positions that you're on, on the sidewalks that you're describing. And if if you if 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 this ordinance that you have in mind were to pass constitutional muster and, 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 and were to be uh, and to become law, it still requires enforcement. It still it's, right. it still requires uh, somebody calling and saying they're they're not in the three feet area where they're supposed to be, can you get over here? So, so, so I'm just curious what you, what you say with that. I think, um, uh, I think part of the reason that there was work towards or an ordinance before is that Chief Sinkowitz was very reluctant to try and enforce something because it was going to take too much time of his officers and, and he didn't have something specific to, to go by. I think, um, I think our current police chief is, this is, this issue is more on her radar than it was on his. But things, one thing that, um, it, it shouldn't be necessary all the time for the police to have to be called. And, and you know, the example that Rich gave of somebody being on his roof. I mean, that's, that's absurd that the police would say, we can't do anything because you don't have a no trespassing sign on your roof. Well, in a similar, in a similar vein, one of our local panhandlers, um, and again, this, this problem is not as bad as it used to be, but there have been times when um, one of these people has brought all of their earthly possessions, dumped them on Main Street, and sat next to them begging for money. So the, a policeman should look at that and say, this is antisocial behavior. You're allowed to beg for money, but you're not allowed to keep all your crap on Main Street. Or to give another example of something that I witnessed, um, one of our local um, uh, beggars uh, decided to sleep in the um, uh, alcove where Guild Art Center is, and that there's a, a stairway that goes down to the Armory Street parking lot. Well, the cops should look at that and say, "You can't sleep there. This is a public passage, and uh, you know this is antisocial behavior. You got to go somewhere else." And I actually called the police department about it and said, "You know, why are you letting this guy sleep? Well, are you the owner of the property? No." Well, you have to get the owner of the property to complain about it. I mean, that's, you know, it displays an attitude. And again, this both of these instances were things that were more happening when Chief Sinkowitz was in charge. And I, I believe that he cared about this issue a lot less than Jody Casper does. And, and that's why things are a little bit better now. And, and I've been, I've sat in on conversations with her and other people from the police department. So, but um, I think, uh, if, if the police department had an ordinance that was very simple and specific, you know, they would it would uh, it would help them to um, enforce good orderly behavior downtown. Um, so I mean, as as one of the downtown councilors, this is probably the top thing that people talk to me about, and so I, I spend a lot of time researching it. And I remember the previous the, the pre previous movement for an ordinance that you're talking about. I was in council at that time, but I remember. It. Um, and there was concerns of, about legal issues then, and I can tell you that since then, there um, other municipalities have tried this, like Worcester, for example, um, and then have had massive lawsuits and have lost every mm -hmm. suit. And so there's now growing um, legal precedent against these sorts of ordinances. So I think that's, that's why I suggested part that you see if Bill Newman would be willing to sit down and have a conversation with you. I, I'm not sure that Bill Newman would be the only person that would challenge, uh, you know, an unconstitutional ordinance, I think. He, well, but if he, if, if he is somebody 
would, would certainly be one of the first to, in this community to challenge it. And, and my guess is that if um, if he were interested in sitting down and trying to to find a way to regulate this behavior so that it passed constitutional muster and didn't interfere and interfered as little as possible with downtown commerce, that you would be more likely to come up with something that would um, pass muster. Certainly have try and have a conversation with them. I'm not I'm not sure there's an answer there. I'm um, not sure. I mean, and, and and so actually, you know, I would love if anyone has like other sort of creative ideas. I would love to hear them, but yeah, we do have to stay within the, the bounds of the Constitution and, and law. And so it's it's something I struggle with very regularly. Peter Wayne, and I'm a business owner downtown, and I have a number. I also own a number of buildings downtown. I just want to echo some of the things quickly and point out that you know the whole conversation is kind of iffy. You know, nobody feels comfortable with it. I know the people. I've known them forever. These are kind, generous, and they donate to everybody downtown. I bet you they all vote Democratic. You know, I always feel like when you make comments like this, you feel like a big bad as a businessman. But I can say that I have nine. I work with nine women in my insurance agency. And if I were to ask. Uh, who would be willing to go up to City Hall um, down at King Street has uh, a cooperative bank to drop something off for me? Not a single person would be willing to go. I had dinner last night with two local attorneys, you know, healthy, strong men. They went, it, somehow it came up and they went on and on about you know how terrible it is. And so I don't have the answers. I don't know if we should check with West Park to see why it's not happening there. Other communities where it's just not happening. It, happens. it doesn't happen in some communities because they're not going to get the money. But in, in affluent areas where they don't have the panhandling, there must be something they're doing. And we can keep kicking it down the road, and, and it's uh, it's uncomfortable and awkward, but I think we really do need to, to address it because it's all that people talk about, as you well know. That's all I have to say. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Thank you. Great. Now I'm late and I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> anyone else? Like, I, I, I just, it, can I just ask yeah. if anyone else who hasn't spoken yet? Yeah. Uh, Garrett Sober, I own a, a commercial condo on the second floor, not retail space, um, in old, old school comments. Uh, so some of the, the remarks about uh, owner residents and renter residents and Jermaine. Um, and one other observation I want to make based on uh, living in South Street. Um, working in that building, there's a whole huge part of Northampton's economy that I haven't heard talked about at all, which is uh, businesses which aren't retail, which aren't restaurants, um, which some of them are law offices, but not all of them. Um, on the, the third floor where the Center for the Arts used to be, uh, there's a flourishing company that um, arranges uh, semesters abroad and uh, study abroad. Uh, and they, they, they're a problem now because they, they have too many employees and used too many parking spaces. I and mean, that's the kind of thing. Um, and, and I know that I don't know much about other businesses that are distributed in our entity that are, again, are not retail and not culinary. But, and, and I'm, I'm not sure what their, what their problems involved there, but that's certainly an important part of the tax base and uh, you know, people going downtown for lunch, et cetera. Uh, in, in regards to the panhandling thing, uh, I, I'm just wondering whether, just as homelessness has brought forth a number of new approaches in terms of uh, comprehensive services and people looking at not this is a group of people uh, who are causing a problem, but this is a group of people who have problems. And I'm, I'm just 
just would be running through my head thinking, well, what if there's a co cooperative effort to hire uh, an outreach person and work with the social service agencies in town, uh, hopefully talk with the business people and find out who's an issue and when are they around and um, you know I suspect there are several different populations that are contributing to this. Some of them are the, the kids who are uh, decided they want to live on the street. Some of them are people from out of town um, who are down on that luck. Uh, and <coughs> shelters in town that are long-term local residents so, you know just it, it's got to be a different way to look at it since um, enforcement as, as a, a, a issue of violations is such a, a problematic approach I'm just curious whether there are other people in other approaches Thank you for, uh, for thank you for talking about. Um, I've heard a term, you know, sort of first floor versus second floor businesses. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I regret that we haven't heard from more more people in those. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's also interesting to me. Um, there are 150 residents in that in those three buildings, um, and I I have yet to figure out what their relationship is with downtown. They're constantly complaining that people were parking in their parking lot, which I never saw. Somehow people were filtering up from Main Street and, and taking their parking business. And now it's gated, which is very problematic for business owners and employees. Um, but you know, it, it, again, it's one of those things like, how do you engage those people in um, participating in, in the community and contributing to it in a more active way than paying their taxes or paying their rent. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Stirling? Thank you very much. Any, anyone else? Oh, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, this is, you guys, on, on the same topic, and um, to build on what uh, Nora Garrett was saying, I saw a video, I'm not going to remember where it was from, but it was a, I think it was a municipality where they had a truck go around with all these the people panhandling in their community saying, you want to work? You know, come work. And they would get them out there picking up trash or whatever. And I've often thought that something like that might help to get people off the streets. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who are out there panhandling look awfully able-bodied to me. And, uh, and I like Peter said, I'm, I'm a good liberal, but I don't like being many of them every day when I walk up there. It's all, I mean, I hear that it was awful. So part of it is not make this a good place for people to be in. I hate to say it, but it's not, not make it a, good, a place where people are making a living by putting their hands up. But maybe we'll, we'll have be more of a place where if you're on the street, somebody's coming to come by and ask you to go pick up trash. Just a just a thought, and if I can find this video, I will send it to you. Okay. Yeah, we, we can look into that idea. Yeah. I don't, you know, what okay. we do. The, the city has to have a process for hiring people, mm -hmm. so I don't know if, if that. They had, you know, they must have had some kind of slush fund or some some money. You know, they paid them like you know eight bucks an hour. I, I don't know what it was. It was it was temporary work. It was uh, so I don't know the mechanism, but I'm sure if I can I can find this video, I'll post some answer on Facebook. Um, <laughs> It, I, you know, we could look into it, but it just occurred to me that it was, you know, it was a good way of getting money in these people's pockets and, and getting them off the street and handling. So, because nothing else seems to be working. It's just great budget. Yeah. I, I asked for them. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, anybody, anybody else? Yeah. I could follow up on something that, um, that Garrett said. There is a downtown person named, uh, his name is Brendan. He, he oh, uses okay. Brugger's as his office and he regularly meets with homeless people and, 
and uh, there's a lot of these people know about him and are given the chance to meet with him. Um, but in, in most cases, uh, also, these people are not necessarily homeless. Some of them are, some of them are not. But most of these people just are not interested in, you know, there's services available that any one of them could go to, but most of them are not interested in restricting themselves that way. They just want to sit out on the street and, and ask for money. But, but, there, but there, are def, there are people that offer services to these people now. It, it, it does exist. Yeah? Just throwing out the city of Albuquerque. Step up, please. You also have to say your name. And All right. <laughs> I know his name. <laughs> Jim Levy, Forbes Avenue, North Kenton. Dorothy's referring to the city of Albuquerque. Oh, is that right? And they allocated $50,000 a year uh, to the program. And there is both written material and uh, uh, videos on the program itself. Thank you for getting a chat reference. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. 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 I forgot one. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I have a long history of the Community Preservation Act. Um, I do land conservation work, um, and I was at least peripherally involved in the effort to pass it in the first place. And uh, as, as a land conservationist, um, there's already a fair amount of angst about how recreational uses are now allowed as an um, area to extend Community Preservation Act funds. And the people that fought long and hard to get that legislation passed from the affordable housing community, from the historic preservation community, from the land conservation community, um, take umbrage that people are kind of trying to We'll get that reaction. No, yeah. Yeah. The, 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 so that said, um, um, and I don't know the mechanics of it, but I'm wondering about bonding. That that's an, an avenue of financing that the city does have at its disposal, and in some ways it's better suited to infrastructure. Yeah, well, that's the basis of, yeah. of our thing. Yeah. Right. I want to speak out yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. If you want to talk about it. Yeah. Um, would anyone else like to speak during the forum on this topic? This is, your, this is the last out of four forums. This is your last chance. Well, you can always come talk to us. but And we have public comment at every meeting. But this sort of specific uh, thing that we are doing here. Right okay. Oh, I thank you all very, very much. We thank you. And it, again, you know, feel free to send um, any sort of written statements that you have. Uh, we're not going to be sort of doing the next step until September. So if, if things occur to you or if there's anything more comfortable to say that you'd like us to know, please submit that um, to Pamela Towers. Um, you know, you can find her at your Thank you very much. Thank you.
had this forum on this topic, this many people spoke, um, and then attached you know, the minutes for people to sort of see more specifically what they said. So I'm not sure how much we have to spend a lot of time drafting that, which is sort of what I thought we were gonna do. But anyway, yeah, please, everybody. Well, I have to say it's very clear, and um, I appreciate all the uh, careful, you know, attention to to each of the forums, and then having attached all of the minutes. I mean, it's really pretty. Uh, the, the request of the, of the request. Yeah, I think that the minutes are really helpful. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I just, I just had a, I, well, I too appreciate you taking the, the, the time to, to offer the, the, the summary, which, you know, is pretty, pretty straightforward and clear, I agree. Um, in, in, in the second paragraph, there's, there's a reference to the uh, work plan, the draft work plan that I prepared and was discussed. And, well, I guess that's kind of a question, because this, this it says the proposed work plan was discussed, including in fact, I would like it amended to say it, yes, it was discussed, but it was it, 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 it was it was really not the key parts of it were not accepted by the committee. Okay, so actually, you're on page two, right? I'm on page two, two of the second paragraph. The second paragraph. Um, okay. Because there were there were a number of, of my recommendations about an early focus on data collection and early deliberation to figure out where did we end up not have jurisdiction. So I, I just would like it, if there's gonna, I don't want to suggest it that this work plan that I put together was in fact adopted, because That's it wasn't. a very good point. Um, so do you have a suggestion for how to change that sentence or an addition? You, you, you could just say, I mean, it, could, it doesn't have to go in specifics, okay. but it could just say some, some elements of the work plan were adopted, some not. I mean, just. And the, and, 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 and the other, and I, and I don't suggest we get back into it all over again, but where, because at our last meeting, you, as our, as our chair, uh, announced that going forward, since there was sort of a parallel track emerging for, for preparation of the wage theft ordinance and bringing it to the council, that, that wage theft matters would be on that parallel track as opposed to coming before this committee. So that, that was kind of a, a big deal. I just thought perhaps it should be reflected in, 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 this, in this report. I mean, I viewed that as sort of more of a, you know, as this report was really more of like, this is what we did. This, these were the steps we followed. This is, um, you know, this is how we gathered the data. And that was more of a like a discussion sort of thing. And so, it's in the it is in the minutes and um, yeah, so I didn't really get into that kind of level. Well, it's true that it's in the minutes. Yeah. Everything right. else here is in the minutes too. It's right. just, uh, it, it, to my mind, that was kind of a, uh, a, a an important development and a big decision, and I just thought it might be reflected here. Well, you know, it was a suggestion that I I made. Yeah, I, I would just say that it, um, even though we did talk about the fact that there were some other conversations that had preceded the, community's, the, the committee study request by months and then had not been suspended but kind of continued on. Um, and, I'll, and I'll also offer that I do, I do feel like there was a, prob you know, a, a probable mistake on my part for participating in some out of committee conversations. But at the same time, we didn't suspend those. And my, and my, um, my understanding was that the committee is still taking up the matter of wage theft. I didn't think, I didn't expect that um, that precluded our ability, especially after the number of hearings that we've had of discussing the matter. Um, I fully expected that we'd probably discuss it by the September 19th meeting or sometime after that. Um, while at the same time, the community group that had been meeting for many, many months before this has still carried on and doing its mobilizing around the city ordinance. So 
Um, I don't see it as an either or. I, I didn't see it as you explained it even at the last meeting as necessarily that. And so I'm hoping that we're, we'll still have the opportunity to digest the uh, the data that we didn't get to really talk about as a committee and the couple of forums, the, the, all, all four forums, um, and prioritizing and you know, doing what we said we would do. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that, you know, I'm, I'm happy, I'm certainly happy to dis to discuss it when we come to, to having this deliberation in September. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I would want to put it forth as a recommendation from the study since it's already in the works as a recommendation, you know, as in so much as how can you have an ordinance without it being a recommendation. Um, and I, I guess my understanding is that it was, all, you know, by the time we get to September, it will already be sort of on the docket elsewhere. Yeah, and some of that is, I think, just some confusion about time frame. Um, there's a lot of people involved and have been, who've been mobilizing on this issue for, like I said, many, many months. But there really isn't a, any draft that's been uh, produced. And so I don't know to what extent it may even coincide coincide with when we get back together in September in terms of deliberation. Um, there may be something at that point, I would, I would expect, um, since folks are continuing working on that, and, that, and it, the scope of people who've been involved in working on an ordinance goes beyond those that were in the, are in this room. Um, so I would, I would expect that uh, there, there may be something to look at and to digest in addition to the actual forums and the data that we have, the study and the, and the things that we received. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm still uncomfortable with the idea of something having been discussed and deliberated during the forums then being part of our recommendations. But, I mean, the other point is, you know, I, I don't think that on September 19th we're going to be able to just, like, come out with these recommendations. I think this is going to take us a few meetings to go through everything. So just in terms of time, if that's putting if that's putting us months ahead, I'm not sure, you know, based on sort of the speed with which you had sort of described this was happening, which I know is a little bit different than how you're describing it, it still seems faster than what I imagine we can possibly do as a committee just because of our schedule, you know, how we, how we schedule meetings. So I don't know if that's right. Should we see what happens um, for September 19th and where things stand and whether we're able to talk about that as, a, as at least a subject matter since we have <coughs> ones and it would be really important, I think, for us to be able to share some of our responses? Sure. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess we, we, I'm not sure what our process will be about you know, figuring out what our recommendations will be and whether we sort of vote on them individually or we create something all together. But, um, you know, we can have that discussion mm -hmm. then and try and figure that out. I don't have anything on this particular point, but I just want to say about the report, I think it's great. I think it provides a kind of framework for what um, we were considering, what we did, and the more substantive kind of work needs to still happen in the deliberations we do over the coming months in this meeting, in this committee. Um, and that's to me where the real, you know, report per se is really going to be, because that's how we, we kind of analyze the comments that we've collected. And um, actually one thing that I was thinking about for the this report is, did I miss it? Is there something about the work that Jonathan did for us and the stuff that was collected that way? I did. Uh, reference. I mentioned, I didn't go into it that in depth. And actually, that's maybe something we should have had. Jonathan, go on page three. On page, page three. The three. numbered page three? Or oh, no, wait, that's just a later reference. There's an earlier. Um... But anyway, I just wanted to say that I think that um, this as a framework is really good. And that um, what 
feels more important to me or most important to me. And not to say that this isn't important, and thank you very much, because I know a lot of time and effort and thoughtfulness went into putting this together. But I think in terms of um, how you move forward, it's the analysis that goes post collection of all the data. And that's you know all of the presentations we had, all the public comment that we had. Um, and I think that there is a parallel track piece happening with the wage theft ordinance that also will end up you know, fitting into this analysis. And um, so I guess the only thing that I think we might need to add to the report is just what the next steps are in terms of how analysis is going to be done. So I'm curious, are we going to actually you know, count the people that talked about panhandling, just as an example? Uh, count the number of people who talked about um, about wage theft, are we going to aggregate the comments? Are we going to analyze them in a particular way? Are we going to do data analysis in some way? So that's that's kind of what is outstanding, I think, for me in terms of how we're proceeding, but also in terms of how we're um, kind of completing this report and saying what the next steps are. That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I guess for myself, sort of how I envisioned I was going to process the information was to kind of read through all of it and kind of take a tally and, you know, and just sort of keep track of, um, you know, this many people spoke on panhandling, this many people spoke on wage stuff. And, and, um, and so I don't, you know, I don't know if we want to all kind of do that and see if we come up with similar numbers or that, that's just how I was going to process it. But you're right. Like how, how do we want to individually process the data, but how do we as a committee want to process it in, in terms of, Producing a report that's other than the Franklin, which is a good question. So this is where someone like Jonathan, who we no longer have access to, could actually be helpful if we had someone. I mean, I think for all four of us to duplicate efforts doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and if we're not going to be able to do it in person in these meetings, um, it almost makes sense to me that somebody from outside this committee would actually do the processing of the data and then we get to take a look at it and put a critical eye to it. Right. Um, I'm just, I'm concerned about a couple things, just the amount of time that could go into really processing it and then the interpretations of the data. You know, I think you can take numbers and qualitative data in a number of different directions and that I guess is the deliberation but how do we do the prep to, to get it to that point? Well, I mean, John, Jonathan's out of the country right now, but I, he has repeatedly said, you know, if you have more things you'd like me to work on, I, I'm happy to do it. So I think we, we could, ask, I mean, he might say he can't, but we can at least ask if he could do something like that. Um, you know, taking all the minutes video and doing that kind of. We just have to tell him what we want him to do. That we see some kind of guidelines. So okay. I wonder if that's something we need to talk about today or next time or something like that. Well, next time is September, so we won't have access to him. <laughs> um, then, I mean, he'll be back in school. Cool. Um, so I think we either need, yeah, we need to do this. We do have access to him between now and I early think September. So. Yeah, I think we have, he, he kept offering more time. So I think that we do have, you know, some more time with him before he goes back to school. Um, yeah. Well, if, if, I mean, if 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 he were willing to, 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 to go through the minutes from from the from the forums and and compile a, a list of topics and with some indication as to the frequency with which those those those, those topics came um, came up and. Maybe some some attempt at, at, at grouping, uh, although like suggested recommendations. Well, I, I don't know about the well. No, not not recommend not our. No, no, but, but well, you're right. If 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 I'm, to take panhandling for example, an outreach work, you know, more attention to an outreach work on social service agencies, a more specific ordinance. So you know, just 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 the three or four things that right. have come up like at one point or another, or right. without, without obviously any attempt at attaching any preference to any of them, but just, just, to, just to document the issue areas and 
brainstormed ideas that had come up in, 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 in addressing that would that that would be a starting point, um, and and you know and, and then in, 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 to my mind one of the things once once we've got that in front of us then then I think we would I would want us to have a discussion about okay do we want to do a sort between those that where we see the council through resolution or ordinance actually have an impact versus those where we want to encourage others, whether it's the mayor or social service agencies or the chamber to do something, or is it an area where we really want to encourage our delegation to pursue state legislation? I mean, to, to, to begin to carve it up that way. Uh, but the starting point would be this, if, 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 if Jonathan took the assignment, this, this uh, breaking it down into issue areas and possible approaches. Mm -hmm. And and if if it would be because I'm always aware of how much falls to you, Madam Chair. If it would be of some help, I'd be I'd be glad to work with you and Jonathan to articulate what I just said. That's, that's, that's the start. Um, and then, yeah, we, I would be happy to. Or, otherwise, I, 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 I too, I've been saying, well, okay, what, what the heck do we do with all this stuff now? Right. Given that we don't have staff, uh, and given that if there's there's there, there, there's a shunk, there's an assumption that we move beyond the procedural report to okay, what does it mean? What are we doing? We actually have kind of a massive amount of data at this point yeah. between our, the different presentations and the reports that were submitted to us and then the public testimony. It's a lot. It is. Yeah, yeah I, actually, and if it's, a, it's a big assignment. It may be beyond what, but, but if, if in each of those issue areas, you were to, to, to match it up then with data and reports, then, you know, it, 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 it could be very helpful. Um, one other thing, just in terms of the structure of this report, yep, that might be useful is just a kind of bullet point for us all of the presentations um, that were made. I mean, they're they're all described in here, but just a simple kind of like chart or bullet point would be really helpful. And um, which ones were um, oral presentations, and which ones we had physical reports on? Is that too annoying to have to pull out? <coughs> I mean, I'm also happy to give a pass at it if that seems useful at all. I yeah, but you want to tamper with it, but you're going to need to give it away. Um, yeah, if you would, if you would be willing to to do that, that would be great. So, so essentially taking that sort of hair. Just so there's almost like an executive summary, as it were, of this that just shows us, like, just look at one page and says, you know, we have this many, uh, this much public comment. These presentations, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, this many written presentations, written uh, reports were submitted to us just so that we know what we're even working with in a paper form, I guess. Is what I'm saying. And okay, so my question is just how do we how do we work on that without having another like how do we work on that, look at it, comment without having another meeting? Uh, I would be totally totally comfortable in 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 um, a pro, you know a, a motion on this to prove and forward the, the report is drafted with the changes we've, we've made subject to adding right? adding, right, that adding, right. adding the a summary the, 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 the bulleted presentations right. and and and. So I could um, just submit it to Pam to distribute as a public access document, right. and then we'll talk about it the next. If there's something that I missed that we can add as an amendment, does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. so, so, so so in other words, so so we are. I'm proposing that we approve it here today. Is that, is that what you had in mind? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, so, my sub, hope sub, is subject to this little 
Right. That so, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Right. She's talking about the mechanics of right. yeah. yeah. amendments yeah. or whatever would be submitted. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then yeah, if you give it to Pam, and then uh, she and I can submit it to the full council, which is what we're to do with it. Um, so this is that's what's happening with this report. Is it's going to the council for our next meeting? For the August eighteenth meeting. I guess so. I mean that you know that's as the as a committee study request reads. That is what you're to do is to create a, a report that goes to the full council. So yes. So I was going to get it to the president and vice president because we are already a little bit behind schedule, which they know. Um, just to you know so that we've fulfilled our duty fairly well within the time frame. Um, and and then you know. I guess what they do with it is not entirely clear to me, but I guess get it to the full council since that's what it says. So since our meeting is August 18th, right? Is that the right date? Um, can we, can you hold off for a week before you submit it to the president and the vice president of the council until I get something as a public document that goes out broadly and it's available, I don't know how, to everyone? So we're not doing any open meeting law, and then send it to them with that once it's all one package. Or is that too? Well, I mean, if it's it can be sent to us, we just can't comment on it, right? Yeah, so we can receive it. So, Pam, we can receive it, huh. and that doesn't violate open meeting law. It's just we can't deliberate deliberate on it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so if you could get it to Pam and then Pam will. But then that doesn't leave any room for anybody to make changes to it, right? And that's I, I, I was suggesting that it would be necessary. I, I'm, 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 I'm totally content to leave it to our chair and you to and Pam to take this document, make the few tweaks that we've talked about here today, add the, the piece that you want, the, the annotated list or, or however, uh, finalize it and call it a done deal. Um, I, 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 I would not see any, any, any need for it to come back other than as a final document. Because we're, we're just talking about a listing and formatting change. We're not talking about anything of, of, of substance as I, as, a, as a, if I understand what you're saying. Unless I forget something and then I guess that's the short thing is it's going to change. Right. I'll, I'll check the dates and facts, and if I see anything incorrect, I will change. We can also, I mean, the other thing we could do is if we see something when it goes to the council, we can request a member of the council. See something, say something. <laughs> if we see something, we can say something in a public meeting. <laughs> yes. Okay. Great. So we'll share that with you. Share the doc with you, Steve. So, do you want this as a as a motion to accept the report? Well, subject, are, subject to are we, what we're talking about is here. Is there? Or? Does anyone else have any further comments or thoughts or? No, no. we're all good. The, I think when the when it turned into a PDF, the spacing got a little bit wonky. So, we will fix that. Um, additionally, <coughs> excuse me, we can add the those missing people amounts on June 27th <coughs> for the public forums. On July 18th. Right. Um, so we can fill in those numbers. And um, and if, you know, in the next week, if, there, if the minutes and video are available, we can add those links. And yeah. Um, is, is there interest in linking to like Jonathan's work? I mean, so I, part, I'm, I did link to some things, but then I also tried to make clear that everything that we've received is on the website, so people can go to the website and get all of that, so I didn't link to all of it. Mm -hmm. So, in some ways I was kind of oddly selective on what I linked to or not, I'm not really sure why. Um, maybe just for ease of reading it. So, I, I could go in and add more links to things that are referenced, or... Um, no, I think if we're, if it's... Go to the, people can access that through the website if they go do that. Right. Like, and I think I say at some point that they're, they're all the 
documents yeah. are on the website. So, okay, great. I have a quick question. Yeah. Who did the translation to Spanish for them? Um, we hired, can you remember the name? It's who, we call the school, the, um, the school department because they do translation a lot and they give us the names of people that, so I tried a couple people and then um, this was a company that does a lot for our, the city. Um, Just curious, I was wondering I if somebody did it out of the goodness of their heart so we could thank them publicly. Oh, uh, we, we paid, paid for it. it, we paid for it. That wasn't much though. It was, no, it didn't, it wasn't much. So it's, it's like to think, you know, I, I feel like the council doesn't translate things often, but right. this is a good lesson that um, maybe this is something that we should do more often. Mm -hmm. And, and it, you know, we I talked to Susan Wright about how to, how to fund it and she, she made that possible. So um, as, as a council, we should think about trying to do that more often. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so I guess we have a motion to accept the report with the addition that Councilor Klein is going to make in the next second. Yeah. Transfluency. Transfluency. Oh, that's the name of the company. I'm like, <laughs> is this like some ruling? Transfluency. <laughs> yeah, that's the company that did that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that, that's a, that's a chance for you to want to make to accept, <laughs> accept the report with the adjustments that we've talked about, right. with the addition yeah. of the council time that we're talking about. And then submit it to the full council. Yeah. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Was there a second on that? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. She basically withdrew her offer. Was going to talk with, with, with you about it, and and in fact, and I, I don't know what the latest is, but uh, if if the chamber were to proceed with their a redo of the survey that they had done a couple of years ago, then it's clearly a chamber document, and, and they share with it, you know, as as other other groups have, without there being some confusion as to whose document is. So if if the chamber decides to do it on their own. And then, and then shares it with us. Uh, and if they, on their own, decide to do some of these exit interviews and entrance interviews and share the results with us, that'd be great. It, was, it, it would be their thing to do without the confusion. Of who was. Did they have a time? Did you say something about the timeline? I don't know what their timeline would be, frankly. Um, they, they, they were prepared. The, 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 the survey, if, if it has you know minimal revisions, they basically just hit a Hit a, hit a button on the survey monkey and they do it. So it's, 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 it can be done pretty quickly, but uh, I don't know if they would try to do it over, over, over the summer. Um, we could certainly let them know that if they are going to do it, it would be great to have it by September. But did, and have you in fact had it? I, I did have a conversation with her and yeah, she, that's this, she indicated the same thing. I mean, that they were, you know, as of right now, we're going to kind of withdraw that offer. Yeah. But, and I, you know, there, was, there seemed to be some possibility of having a discussion about it later, um, but for right now, that, that's what she indicated. Um, so, so where does that leave us in terms of a, a survey, do you think? And, you know, do we want to go back to the idea of um, sort of creating something on our own or having Jonathan create something? We've just given Jonathan <laughs> Thoughts on that? I think we have a lot of material. We do have a lot of material. 
ahead of us potentially, you know, and, and um, so it could be something that we can talk about in September and see, you know, if we're going to be sort of working on this over a period of months, we could revisit that idea. We could we could see um, what the timeline is for the chamber yeah. doing, doing their survey and what their inclination is to then share with us. Uh, and if they are going to share some of us, we take a look at it and decide is do we need anything beyond this or we have enough data that right. we need to just wrap our arms around it and get to work. What what was the main piece that we were hoping to get at that we didn't get from our process the exit surveys? Well, the, the, there, there are two distinct uh, projects that the chamber was talking about. One was an update of the survey that they did two years ago, and that was the data that Suzanne initially shared with us. Yeah. Um, so just getting more updated. Getting more updated, and and she opened the door to just a, a, a few additions. But, but, but when it got to be a whole rewrite by committee is where she said, no, that, yeah. that doesn't work, and I get that. Um, so that, 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 was, that, was, that was one of them, and had we involved ourselves in a, a little tweaking we talked about, seeing if we could get some, some comparative Northampton, Amherst, East Hampton data. That was one of the things that would have been of interest to me to add to it. Uh, and maybe they'll decide to do that on their own. But the, but the other, and it was a distinct thing, was to kind of get more stories like sort of what Pat Goggins was talking about. Why did folks choose to invest in Northampton, locate their business here, and buy or rent? And conversely, why did folks close up shop? Um, so we, you know, start to get some real data on. Well, they were they were retiring, had nothing to do with you know water and sewer rates or whatever else. And, and they may very well, again, just for their own purposes, the chamber decide to do that. I really don't know if, 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 if they would, if, but if they would, without revealing any confidentiality, I would think that they would be fun to share. I think another thing that we were, we talked about being interested in was, um, you know, if, if businesses shared sort of what the percentages of their costs were, just so we could really see, you know, where, where their pressures are. Um, and so I don't know if the chamber, survey already kind of tries to capture that or whether we'd be able to get that. But I think it was, there was sort of a desire to try and see if we could get that. Yeah, and I, 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 I saw it a long time ago. And I still don't remember how specific it was with regard to uh, occupancy costs as a, as a percentage of total revenues. There, there was some of that in there, but I don't remember. But. I mean, it'd be nice to see, like, kind of get a, a breakdown see, you know, like, so what percent are they paying for um, sick time? What percent are they paying for rent? What percent are they paying for staff? You know, just to kind of get, you know, a data sense of it, because we've heard a lot of it. And, and maybe to see that there are differences in different kinds of businesses. Okay. Okay, I'm sure there are. I mean, one way to think about this is to look at, um, which is, I mean, this is all, all these things that you, you two just kind of shared as what we might be able to gather with the right survey are incredibly important things about this discussion. But at the same time, the question is, which of those things are things that we as a council could actually have some impact on? And so kind of knowing what their pressure points are is important, but then there's a question, how much are we going to address certain kinds of pressure points? You know, they're paying a lot for the people who staff their establishments. I'm not sure there's a lot we can do with that. So maybe a little further down the line when we do our analysis, we can know what kinds of things we might be able to do, and then we might be able to understand a little bit better what we need to collect and not collect. And one sense? of our recommendations can be that, you know, we think some other committee, maybe, maybe not, but you know, look at some of these things further, or you know, mm -hmm. something is established to look at, at something more in depth than we can do. So I'd imagine there will be enough things for that. That's what we're right. saying. Yeah. We, we we need we need more we need more data, or we need a mm -hmm. more information. 
information in, in this particular area, perhaps so and so can do it. And we could say, you know, we've exhausted, we've collected all this information, we have a lot on our plates, we're going to do the analysis of what we have now, and like you're both saying, somewhere down the line, um, delve deeper into something that kind of bubbles mm -hmm. up that we feel like we don't have enough information about, and just kind of put those tools on the back burner until we know whether or not we need more information along those lines. Right. Yeah. But, but I also think that even if it's, even even though I'm, I was early on talking about this, get clear about areas where we have jurisdiction and not. Just having heard so much information, and to the extent that we saw one of our roles as kind of debunking misinformation, uh, if, if, if in fact we continue both anecdotally and through, through, through the data to, to, to hear that among the reasons folks choose to locate Northampton or are reluctant to locate in Northampton, uh, the, the the combined cost of, of taxes and fees is not even in the top five of what you hear about. I mean, if, if we if we feel we've heard enough information of that sort to say something like that, then then I think we should. Um, just because you know, there's there's there there there's there just by virtue of doing what we've been doing. We've generated a lot of that kind of talk. And if, if we're confident that some of that we've looked into and is misplaced, then we should say so. We may need data to right. support or debunk particular things. That yeah. we I mean, I feel like that's somewhere where a survey might be helpful because obviously you have a self-selecting group of people who are willing to come and talk about this. And so it's not necessarily a representative sample. Right. Do, mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Okay, so can I say one more thing about this? I feel like we're talking a little bit about qualitative versus quantitative um, study, and, and like you're saying, even the qualitative piece that we're doing is not particularly scientifically um, gathered. Yeah. So that makes me feel more inclined to thinking seriously about pursuing some kind of quantitative piece to accompany the qualitative. So, but it doesn't have to be now, I want to end by saying that. But I do think that there is a little bit of an imperative for us to have both of those pieces. Yeah, I think it's definitely something to keep in mind and that be careful about drawing conclusions or at least any anything, any recommendations we have that we make clear that that sort of caveat to it. Um, so any more on the story? So just to sort of sum up where we are, we are kind of going to take this back up as an idea at, while or after we kind of delve into all the data in starting September. Is that, mm -hmm. that what we can find on that? Yeah. Okay. Do we have a backup plan if Jonathan's not able to be the person that does our analysis? I mean, do we have the time to like solicit somebody before September, or some statistics professor at Smith that wants to do some kind of, you know, research project with a student, or do we want to try and pursue that just in case, or can we hear no from Jonathan? Or will that take too much time? Um. Jonathan can 
do it, then I think we're just gonna muddle through the best we can. Mm -hmm. And once again, let's thank Pam for extraordinarily good, clear well, also. minutes. Thank you. Very detailed minutes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the next item on the agenda is next steps. I feel like we've been covering that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I think we covered that. And after that, new business. Anyone have any new business? No. No? Okay. Well, then, um, thank you. I think we should be really proud that we just did. Yeah. I mean, we have, no one's ever done a committee study request before. And we got kind of like the mother of all committee study requests handed to us. So um, I think that we should all be really proud that we have gone through this process. I think we've done a really good job and collected all of this. And um, I think we should enjoy August thinking of all the work that we've done. So. Thank you for managing it. Thank you very much for managing it. And, 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 and at every one of the forums at the end, there have been various people who said, thank you for doing this. And, 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 and so there is, there is an appreciation that we went through a process of, good of listening. Yes. And yeah, I was, there were a lot of people today. There were a lot of very, very thoughtful, yeah. very thoughtful uh, comments. And, and, and I appreciate the willingness of some folks to talk about stuff that, that you know, as Peter Whalen said, it's, it's awkward and messy, but there are issues that are out there that they're both willing to put it out there and talk about. Yeah, so I, I think it was, it's been a good, good public discussion that we've had, so thank you, everyone. Thank you. Move to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. All right.